and welcome to Varm Blog. And today I have Eric Olander of the China and Africa Project, or the China Africa Project. And we are going to be discussing the nuances, complexities, and uh, various small details of the relationship between China and the various countries in the African continent. Um, I was tearing Eric off air that my interest in this came from at first living in South Korea and then spending some time in China and then uh, moving for a job into Egypt and um, watching the relationship uh, of of China and Egypt really unfold, particularly um, after the the LCC consolidation of power that some might call a counter-revolution. Um, and I was also mentioning that, you know, we tend to cater to leftists here and the dialogues about China tend to be either kind of standard liberal affair, which is dogmatically anti-China or uh, people who basically read China daily and take it as gospel. Um, uh, and probably even are less critical than that. Um, so I wanted to ask you how, you know, you've been doing reporting on China for what, 25 years? At least. I started, uh, first time I went over there was 1989. And then I started anchoring in Hong Kong in 1990 doing radio. So basically 1990 till today. So that's 30, 31 years, 32 years now. Yeah, and you were saying that the the the, the China Africa project really began because you saw a gap in the coverage yeah. because most of the coverage you saw was was highly ideologically polarized That's even right. 15 years ago. Yeah, so so my early career was doing was reporting from from Asia. And so mm -hmm. I speak Chinese, I studied Chinese and I started working in Taiwan and then Hong Kong in the late 80s and early 90s. I then went on to the, I was the Associated Press correspondent for television in Beijing. I also did CNN, uh, BBC, you know, the alphabet soup of networks, CNBC in Singapore. And so my background is all was in Chinese journalism and Chinese public affairs and Chinese political science. Uh, then my brother moved to the Congo in 2005 in Kinshasa to uh, start up a production company there to produce soap operas. So I thought, you know, at that time I was running the largest Asian TV station in the US, uh, kind of like a Telemundo for Asian immigrants out of Los Angeles. So mostly Chinese uh, immigrants in Los Angeles. So I was, you know, I said, let me go see my brother in, in Kinshasa for Thanksgiving. And that was mm -hmm. 2005. And when I went to Kinshasa in 2005, there was one Chinese restaurant in a city of 11 million people. And it proved to me that there's literally a Chinese restaurant in every city in the world. I went back in 2006 to see him and there was two Chinese restaurants. And I thought, OK, that's kind of neat. By seven, eight and nine. And I went back every year to see him. It just went boom. I mean, there were Chinese people everywhere. Mm -hmm. There was Chinese construction projects going on, Chinese mm -hmm. stores. It was just remarkable. And you got this sense that something was happening, but you couldn't put your finger on what exactly it was. In 2010, I moved there to run my brother's production company. So mm -hmm. I moved to Kinshasa. And, you know, again, my background in Chinese affairs, I was still really interested in what was going on in, in, in everything with Africa and the Chinese. And this time there was a lot of the coverage. And reading the New York Times, The Guardian, The Wall Street Journal, it was very much the same coverage we see today, which is henny penny, the sky is falling, China's conquering Africa, China's taking over Africa. It portrays Africa as the victim's of yet another foreign power. And you see mm. this very much as a prominent theme today in, in a lot of the, the US and European media coverage. And, and there's also an implied benevolence of the United States and Europe. That's an, always an interesting subtext in all of this. Well, the Chinese are bad, but our aid programs are good. And I was like, okay, interesting. I And again, I, I had no reason to question any of this. Mm -hmm. I then look at the Chinese media and it is, you know, win-win, everything's great. Oh my God, it's amazing. They love us. Everything's sunny and rosy. And I was like, wow, how do these two things live side by side one another? So then I asked my employees in Kinshasa, I said, what do you guys think of the Chinese? What are, you know, what's on your mind, you know? And what was incredible about it, and this is very much the same thing today, 
is they gave me these really complex, textured, nuanced answers. You know, I like this, but I don't like that. Mm -hmm. And nothing was polarized. Nothing was binary. And I said, that's my story. That is my story, is the complexity of it, the messiness of it, where the good and the bad sit side by side. And so if you're of the opinion that the, whatever the Chinese are doing, and this is not just, for example, in Africa, this also applies to South America, to Central Asia, other parts in the global south. If you're of the mindset that China is only bad, and that's all you see, and that's, again, a very prominent narrative in, in the U.S. and parts of Europe, and even here in some parts of Asia, well, then you're missing a big part of the story. Mm -hmm. And conversely, if you are of the mindset that whatever China's doing is good and it's great and it's benevolent and it's wonderful, well, you're also missing a big part of the story. So I started blogging and... Uh, and Uh-oh. Let's see. Let's give it a second. You know, this is back in 2010, okay? So, you know, it was blogger back then, okay? Sorry, I lost my connection there. Um, I started blogging back in 2010, and it was – this was new back then. And, and But I said – so I just started writing, and I started going to talk to Chinese merchants in Kinshasa, just the guy on the streets, and I just was like, you know – tell me your story. And this complex viewpoint that wasn't polarized on one side really found an audience. And now fast forward 12 years later, we have over a million followers. We've got a very successful paid newsletter. We do a podcast with Seneca Network and SubChina. Um, and we've still stayed true to this idea of that we are, we don't have a horse in the race. Our goal is not to try and persuade you about anything related to the Chinese. Are they good? Are they bad? Uh, we're not pro-African. We're not pro-American. We're not pro, we're pro nothing. And we're just trying to give people really good information on what's a really complex topic that few people really understand very well. I will say when I was in Egypt, I actually used you guys as a resource a fair amount. Oh, uh, fantastic. I was a subscri subscriber, but I, I followed uh, the Seneca's, works all the way back to when I lived in um, uh, South Korea. And, and I was very interested in the nuances of what was going on um, in, uh, in Egypt in particular. And, and we're going to get to some, some interesting things about that. Cause I, I often point out my observation when I lived in Egypt, I met uh, I lived in the Maadi, which is like a foreigner district. It's one of the two, and it's one, it's like the lesser one because it's not Zemelek where all the you know rich hoity-toity British used to be. Um, but still, for Egypt, it's a pretty nice part of town. And my neighborhood was predominantly uh, Chinese, South Cor and South Korean, and uh, a few a few Americans and Canadians, and um, but a lot of the, the the Chinese I met who ran the various there's like seven Chinese restaurants in this little part of Cairo, um, and I will also say since we're speaking about Chinese restaurants, um, I knew that they came there for for the for Chinese workers because it was a fairly authentic Chinese food, whereas I've, there's a Chinese restaurant everywhere, but it's usually the Chinese, the local version of Chinese cuisine. So when I was in like uh, Korea, it was Chinese Korean food. Um, and the, the food that I think I got um, in, uh, in, in Cairo was mostly like Western China, Western Chinese food. Um, you know, Kung Pao so, chicken kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, no, no, no. I mean, not Western, like our Western, like from Western China. Oh, so, Western China. like Because Uyghur it was food. very different. Yeah, it was like Uyghur food. It was very yep. different than what I was expecting. Because um, I was, you know, my, I had been, you know, I've been to Beijing. I've stayed in Shanghai. I spent a lot of time in uh, Taipei. And it was not that. And it also wasn't Western Chinese food. And it also wasn't South Korean Chinese food. And I was like, huh. So... What I wanted to ask you is you said that Egypt plays a key role in this in this uh, um, issue with the, the, the Muslim um, mm -hmm. minority ethnicities on the in the Western China. Would you like to go into that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So Egypt is arguably one of the most important 
countries in Africa for the Chinese. And now China divides its diplomatic presence in Africa into two parts. It's got the MENA region and it's got uh, the sub-Saharan African region. So taking that into account. But uh, China looks at Egypt as really, I mean, again, much the same way that the U.S. looks at Egypt and other foreign powers do because of its strategic location, because of its traditional role as the heart of the Arab street, because of its enormous population in Africa, uh, you know, 90, 90 plus million people. I mean, it's a big country. And, and so it's got a big consumer market and domestic market that other African countries don't have. But let's just go back to the beginning of this year. Uh, so every year, the Chinese foreign minister, and this is a tradition that dates back 32 years now, and a very important tradition that's going to continue next year as well, even amid the pandemic. The Chinese foreign minister makes his first overseas trip of the year always to Africa. And it's symbolically important. And this is really, again, a very important note, just to contrast with the United States, which took Blinken more than a year to make it to Africa once. Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister now, has been three times and will come back next month again. And he was just in Ethiopia and in Senegal for the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation Conference, which we'll talk about, and then also in Ethiopia. But he started in January this year uh, in a tour uh, of Africa. But in last year, he did his first step he did to uh, Africa and he went to Egypt and he brought the the message of uh, Xinjiang right to the heart of the Arab street and to Cairo. And it's been very important for the Chinese to mobilize Arab support and Muslim support for Chinese policies on Xinjiang. And what was interesting was al-Sisi and the Egyptian foreign minister and the Egyptian elite all welcomed uh, China, and they really take the narrative very seriously about fighting Islamic extremism. And, and that's the narrative that Africans and Nigerians, and even this week there was an op-ed in the Liberian Observer newspaper, which praised China's handling of the Uyghur and Xinjiang affair in, in the context of cracking down on Islamic extremism. So getting the support of the Egyptians on this sensitive issue is really important to mobilizing China's own coalition against the pressures it's facing from the US and Europe predominantly on this, this issue. So again, and, and he starts that campaign in, uh, in Egypt, and then it's kind of taken it from there to other to other countries. The other reason why Cairo in particular is very important, it's the home to the Arab League. So this year, China donated vaccines specifically to the Arab League. So Chinese diplomacy in Egypt has been very robust, very active. It, it, it transcends both the geopolitical, as we've talked about with the Uyghurs, but also it, uh, it also is important in terms of trade because of the Suez Canal. The Chinese are investing heavily in industrial parks along the Suez Canal area. And also, Egypt has been one of the main beneficiaries and recipients of Chinese vaccines. And they're also, it's one of the first places in Africa to start up a vaccine manufacturing facility which is uh, something that is, uh, is quite interesting because that hasn't happened in many other parts of the world. And they were faster than other countries, specifically from the US and Europe, to set up these manufacturing facilities. So Egypt has been a very, very important anchor for the Chinese in Africa. Hmm. So I've been, I, have, I noticed that really accelerating when I lived through the Chinese, uh, not Chinese, the Egyptian financial crisis of six years ago, when the uh, when they were finally pressured to floating their currency, and um, I became a lot more wealthy overnight. To be frank, um, and it was a wild time, and we immediately saw CC really pivot um, pretty quickly. Actually. First, from taking a lot of funds from Saudi Arabia, not so much the West directly, into trying to increase um, trade with China, including moving the capital um, to what at the time by a lot of locals was seen as an act of hubris into the middle of the desert, which which is being finished in uh, a very an, modern city. A... It is a marvel of engineering what they've been doing in the new administrative capital. There's brand new subways going out. The towers are being built. It's literally rising out of the sand, out of nothing. And, and again, this speaks to 
the the Chinese, and and this is something that that Egyptians have said over and over again about the, about their relationship with the Chinese. They they make things happen fast, mm -hmm. and in developing countries, that is absolutely critical, and it's one of the key advantages that the Egyptians have over the United States and others is their ability to execute quickly. And the new administrative capital is really a case study for that. So I. Um... I was going to ask you, though, a lot of my audiences uh, are leftists of various stripes, mostly sure. you know, uh, kinds of Marxist. Um, one of the observations that I heard the most when I was in Africa is that, you know, um, probably the Chinese were a better business partner than the U.S. and definitely than France, where there's a lot of rightful, actually, anger at France still, you know. Uh, uh, I used to work with people from Mali who would get really angry if you mentioned the F word. Um, but the, there does seem to be a sense where the, the Africans do not really think the Chinese are engaged in a like ideologically anti-imperialist project or anything like that. Um, is this a fair view on their part? Well, is this it, it, it is. It's a fair. I mean, so it's interesting because in the 60s and 70s, uh, Mao was very much involved in the ideological struggles and the anti-colonial movement. And that is really very important to this day, because one of the themes that you hear in the senior Chinese di diplomatic messaging in Africa is China's support of the liberation movements and the anti-colonial movements. And that gives a whole lot of street cred. Uh, today in that because they they ended up being on the right side of history for that. And so so it's it, to, back then in the 60s, 70s and arguably into the 80s as a little bit there were not so much in the 80s, but definitely in the 60s and 70s. There was a very strong ideological approach today. Uh, there is an ideological approach, but it's not at all the same ideological approach. So, uh, so and, and again, there is no single simple answer here. And I think a lot of mm -hmm. people and the trouble you get into here is that you want to boil it down to it's this or it's that. Uh, the, the history of the Chinese in Africa is radically different than the history of the U.S. or the Europeans. Obviously, the Europeans have this centuries long oppressive colonial uh, imperialistic tradition that's there. That is a that is created and led to historical traumas today that continue to haunt people. And we just saw this on play, uh, you know, unfold in, in Uganda, where there's these enormous anxieties about uh, Chinese, what they call debt trap diplomacy. And the debt trap diplomacy narrative, again, there are a lot of problems with, the, with what the Chinese are doing in Africa. We can talk about environmental destruction. We can talk about illegal immigration, corruption, the lack of transparency in deals, lots and lots of problems. But the the narrative that the Chinese are seizing assets in lieu of debt payments is, is a fabrication. It just doesn't exist. There is no evidence whatsoever to support it. But the anxieties that you hear from a lot of people in Africa is as a result because it is in the historical memory, the recent historical memory, where they have lost control of their countries. Again, colonialism is in my lifetime. I'm older than you are. But mm -hmm. these countries were liberated, many of them, in my lifetime. So that is not that long ago. And, and so, so when we, when it's not really fair or accurate to compare the U.S., the French, and the Chinese, because each comes with a very different historical context. Mm. The French today, uh, again, and I just, I laugh at this because the, the, the sensitivity that people have to the Chinese in Africa, particularly in the U.S. and European press, is, is quite remarkable when you look at the behavior of the French in Africa to this very day. Yeah, uh, where the, the French deploy troops without UN mandates. The French are highly interventionist. The French, uh, you know, have corporate interests that extend deep, deep into, uh, you know, into into Francophone Africa. The French influence is diminishing quickly. There's no doubt about it, uh, you know, in part because of the Chinese. Uh, but there are very much different standards with which the publics evaluate the relationships that they have with their foreign powers and how outsiders look at this issue. And uh, and the Americans, too. I mean, let's look about the Americans. The, the issue, I mean, I think people overstate the Americans, and I say that in such a way that I think that they're giving them too much credit. Mm -hmm. um, the, I mean, so a couple of weeks ago, Turkish President 
uh, Erdogan was on a tour of Africa, and it turns out that Turkey trades $26 billion a year with Africa, which is quite significant for a country the size of, of Turkey. So I thought, let me just look that up and compare it to, say, what the United States does. The United States does $32.5 billion of trade a year. Now, the Turkish economy is the size of the GDP of the state of Illinois, okay? So mm. basically, the United States is doing the same amount of trade as the state of Illinois would do with Africa. And the U.S. presence in Africa is very traditional. It basically boils down to two different categories. One is security, so uh, military presence. So there's quite a bit of, of military training, military engagement. Uh, we obviously have the base in Djibouti and so, and what, and so forth. And then there's aid. Um, and, and very big aid programs, very important aid programs, I should say, but it doesn't really extend that much more than that. And that's the same programs that they have had in place for, you know, for decades now, whereas yeah. the Chinese are doing this year, the Chinese are going to do 220 billion in trade probably. So we're looking at seven times the amount of what the Americans are doing. Uh, Chinese investment. There's a new report that just came out from Ernst and Young is seven times the size of, I'm sorry, three times the size of what the Americans are doing. It generates three times as many jobs as what the Americans are doing. So the Americans really aren't that much of a player. So in some ways, we're giving more credit to the United States than they actually deserve when we actually compare Chinese and U.S. economic engagement in Africa, because the U.S. really isn't that engaged there. You know, you look at companies like Transin, which is a company that most people haven't heard of outside of Africa, but it 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 has about a 60% share of the smartphone market and an even higher share of the feature phone market. And this is a Chinese company. Most of the phones that people are using today in Africa are made by Transin. And, yeah. uh, you know, and Boomplay, which is their music service, is just crushing it compared to uh, Spotify and Apple Music. Uh, Start Times is one of the largest... Uh, you know, satellite TV services. So they're creating products and services specifically for the African market. And that is something that the U.S. and Europe are not really doing. So again, I think the comparisons between the U.S. and, and, and China oftentimes um, are overstated on the U.S. part and give more credit than they deserve. I wanted to even go into like the aid uh, military thing, because in some places, I'm, again, I'm thinking of Egypt where I live for a while. Egypt is huge. It's huge. Yeah. And there's no difference. The aid is the because of a clause in the Cap David Accord, the aid mostly goes into buying used US military equipment. So two billion, two billion dollars a year to that. And and that's why again a lot of people are even looking at the at the summit for democracy right now with a little bit of a jaded eyebrow. Because mm. you know, there are quite a few countries in there that uh, I think Nigeria was on that list, and Nigeria just banned Twitter. I mean you know, there, there's, there's, it's it, again, it, it's super complicated on these things. In the United States, generally, it exercises values-based diplomacy, and I'm not saying this to be critical of the U.S. per se. I just point it out because I think it's inconsistent at best. They exercise values-based diplomacy in countries where they don't have strategic interests, and in countries like Egypt, where they have strategic interests, those values get thrown to the wayside. Yeah, and I, and that is, and I think that's what we've seen over and over again. I, I had a hard time explaining to Americans that until Trump declared Jerusalem the capital of Israel, that Trump was more popular in Egypt than Obama with people who are not highly educated, because of Obama, because of the view that Obama had betrayed his mission with that speech he gave in Egypt, and I believe it was in two thousand eight. Um, mm. The famous apology speech, right? right? And because because he sat on his hands and played both sides and was, you know, during the Egyptian revolution, and you know, found a way that no matter what happened and no matter who was in charge, we were going to continue the relationship with the military regardless. Um, and that really soured the average Egyptian to the Democrats in the U.S. In so much that they knew that, I mean. Um, and it, it's a very interesting thing because I did see that diplomatically the, um, it seemed to me that the Chinese were able to benefit off that. And they also knew how to play regional tensions, uh, kind of against each other pretty well because of like, for example, people probably don't really understand this in America, but the tensions between 
Saudi Arabia, uh, Qatar, and Egypt are complicated. And there is, um, because of Qatar stands towards the Muslim Brotherhood, blah, 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 there were tensions with, that Egypt was able to smooth over in a way that the United States couldn't deal with at all. Like, yeah. it just threw the U.S. diplomatic corps uh, for a loop when I was there, when they were like, when like, you know, the Egyptian government was blocking Al Jazeera because of um, tensions between this faction and that faction. And this kind of ties into what you're saying about why Egypt is probably a good place if the Chinese want to justify uh, uh, the, the, their Uyghur anti extremist. Uh, I think it's part of their nation building project, honestly. Um, it is weird to talk about China having a nation building project, but consolidating a national identity. Um, yeah. Um, that, that there'd be a lot of sympathy, particularly from the central government in Egypt for anti-extremist actions, because that is kind of the promise of Al Sisi's military government is that they will keep the extremist, uh, from taking over, um, um, Egypt, which actually puts, which in the reason in the Sunni world puts them aligned with people that you wouldn't think and against people that you wouldn't think, because there's tensions between Egypt and Turkey, but, but there's a stronger friendship between Egypt and Saudi Arabia. And from the American mindset, none of this makes any sense. And yeah. China doesn't get caught up in that. Actually. No, I mean, it, and and what's what's interesting is that China has been able to manage its relationships in the Muslim world quite deftly. I mean, mm -hmm. it. I mean, very few countries have close ties with both the Saudis and the Iranians the way the Chinese do, or the Israelis and the Arab world the way they do, or the Emiratis and the Qataris and these and the Gulf countries, uh, you know, the way that the Chinese do. And the, and in part, it's because the Chinese are seen. In 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 business and commercial terms, they're not seen as a uh, as as a hegemon the same way that the Americans are, and you are not going to see the Chinese fleet kind of patrol, uh, you know, the Persian Gulf and 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 the Suez and 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 those places the same way that the U.S. has done. They're not going to ever. That's just not the way. That's not the Chinese priorities in in security. Uh, yeah. You're going to see the Chinese protect their oil lanes in the Indian Ocean, that they will do. And that's what the base in Djibouti is very important for. Uh, but because they're not perceived as an interventionist power or as a hegemonic power in that respects, uh, there isn't the same kind of anxiety about the Chinese as there is about the, the Americans. And that's why, in many reasons, they get a pass on some of the more controversial issues like Xinjiang, for example, where uh, the Saudis and others look at that and say, listen, uh, business is business and politics is politics. And we'll focus on business with the Chinese and we won't really talk politics and keep that all to a, a whole separate channel. And when the Americans and others try to come in and say, but what about X? And they go, da, 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 ch, 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 ch. business is business, politics is politics. Our relationship with Chinese is a commercial relationship, and that gives them enormous amount of space to owe to sidestep a lot of these these potholes that you've talked about that you've no doubt run into when you see the the Sunni Shia divides, the Arab Israeli divides, so many of the the other areas that have complicated U.S. and even Russian relations in those in those in that part of the world. Yeah, um, I guess where. Where have been the hiccups of Chinese um, involvement in Africa? Where where yeah, have they not been as question. effective? That's a great question. So uh, let, let's kind of go back just okay. to, in order to get to that question. Let me just kind of go back to the to the origin story. OK, mm -hmm. so let, let me take you back to the old ancient days of the early 2000s. <laughs> and uh, and in the early 2000s, this is when China's economy was still coming out of the 90s boom. It was still growing very quickly. And at then President Hu Jintao uh, came up with this this thing called the going out policy because Chinese the, the Chinese economy was starting to overheat. It was just growing too fast, but they wanted to create opportunities for their companies in order to continue growing. The goal was to make them global players. So they looked out onto the world and they said, where can we go? And if we're going to go out, where can we go? Well, they were already pretty active here in Southeast Asia. Uh, but when they then looked into, uh, you know, the big markets, Japan, 
Europe and the United States, they said that the the barriers to entry were simply too high. The regulatory barriers were very costly. They were also they didn't they lacked the sophistication. They looked at Latin America and South America and they said too far away cultures that we don't really understand. And then there's Africa. And again, Central America also had the, the additional problem of being perceived as, again, this Monroe Doctrine type of thing in the Western Hemisphere that's the United States backyard. Chinese coming in in a big way into the Western Hemisphere would be seen negatively, especially in as we were still so close to the Cold War, to the ending. So, um, so then there's Africa. The United States largely disengaged from Africa after both the Cold War and as the U.S. became a major oil producer of its own. So, it, you know, Nigeria used to be the fifth largest supplier of oil to the United States, but the U.S. cut that all out. So the U.S. basically took its eye and looked at Africa as this basket case of war, famine, aid, child soldiers, you know, uh, you know, HIV, safaris, you know, all of the traditional stereotypes that define Africa in the American imagination to this day. Europe did the same thing. Europe took its eye off Africa as well. It, it disengaged, it focused elsewhere, and it started to look at Africa as, well, let's keep the brown and black people on that side of the Mediterranean. And it became an immigration nightmare for them, which, again, still very much is the driving imperative for Europe today in Africa is to keep Africans on their side of the Mediterranean. So here's a here's a continent that was not only unencumbered by geopolitical challenges, had low barriers to entry, low regulatory barriers, and was eager, I mean, just enthusiastic to embrace an alternative major power like the Chinese to help them break the dependency that Africans had long and historically had on Europe and the United States. And, and one cannot overstate the reservoir of resentment and frustration that people throughout Africa and many parts of the global south have towards uh, the, the former colonial powers. And it is something, again, in, in the Western world, there's this notion, there's some romanticization of colonialism, which is just weird and bizarre and absurd. And we saw this on full display uh, about six weeks ago when there was the uh, Africa-France summit where uh, Emmanuel Macron, the French president, invited 13 young African leaders onto the stage and they just ripped into him. They say, we are tired of your aid. We are tired of your dependency. We are tired of your paternalism. What we want is to be treated as equals and we want to do business and we want partners. So the Chinese come rolling in and say, listen, um, we're not going to give you aid because that's not how we do things. We're not going to give you, uh, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to intervene in your politics. We just want to do business and we're going to give you contracts. We're going to do business with you. Does that sound good? And everybody went, sign me up. So what, and this is what leads to the problems today. Mm -hmm. What ended up happening is uh, about 15, 20 years ago, they started just, the cash was flowing. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, it's just like, it was just endless. And this is the beginning of the Belt and Road. And there was just more money than you could possibly imagine. You want a railroad, you want a highway, you get a, a you know, a new hospital, whatever you want, call it Belt and Road, bam, billion bucks here, a billion bucks there. And then they started doing these big deals in places like Angola for these resource for infrastructure deals. And what they're and they said, okay, you don't have a lot of capital to build infrastructure, but you have oil. So what we'll do is we'll give you infrastructure, you give us oil, and that's a win-win right there. And here's the interesting part of this: that deal, that arrangement that they did back in you know 20 years ago was actually intended to try and relieve Africans of a heavy debt burden. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and it was a very creative way of financing infrastructure development, because how else are these countries going to grow in infrastructure without infrastructure? But how are they going to get the infrastructure if they don't have the cash? Well, they've got a valuable resource. So let's use that resource to build the infrastructure. Very innovative, very creative way. But in Angola, it created a very big problem. So about 75 percent of all the oil that's being sold went to pay for the infrastructure that was built in Angola, the problem that then led to was a capital crisis, a shortage of cash. There, were, there literally was not enough cash coming into the economy to, to avoid massive inflation. 
So all of a sudden, Luanda becomes one of the most expensive places on the planet. And, and, and again, it's one of the unintended side effects of these deals. So that was one part is these resource for infrastructure deals have not panned out at all the way that they hoped. And we're seeing this unfold right now in the Democratic Republic of Congo with the, the big cobalt and copper mining deals mm -hmm. as well, where the how do you measure the value of the infrastructure versus the value of the, the resource? And, and so that's got him a problem. So problem number one was the resource for infrastructure deals. The Chinese have backed away from that. They're not doing as many of those. Uh, they've learned the lesson, and so you're not seeing that. Second, uh, the other part of it was, and that's formed a big problem, is the, the, the Chinese insistence on opacity in their dealings. So the Chinese do not have a political system uh, that is like ours or like the Europeans that really engages with civil society that, that is more open. Now, obviously, our political system has enormous problems and there's enormous corruption and no one's going to put make, make pretend that, that the U.S. is the benchmark or the standard. But there is more transparency in our system than there is in the Chinese system. Mm -hmm. So the Chinese bring their way of doing business when they go to places like Africa. And that is a very opaque way. They prefer to do things uh, behind closed doors. Their contracts have a lot of secrecy clauses, not a non-disclosure agreements. In many ways, the Chinese system and the Chinese way of doing business is actually heavily inspired by Swiss banking laws. So a lot <laughs> of the contracts uh, are commercial loan contracts that use Swiss banking laws. As their, as their template. So again, I've always said that in many instances, the Chinese are behaving in Africa much more like Goldman Sachs than they are like an imperialist power, like the East India, British East India Company. In fact, in many respects, they're using the same standards and practices that the US and Europe have used for decades and then invented. Again, the, 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 the commercial loan contracts is a great example of this. But what this, what in, in countries that have very low levels of trust in governance, uh, is so in, in many developing countries, they look at this opacity and these secret dealings as really that the, that the Chinese are colluding with their corrupt governments. OK, and, and, and mm -hmm. Africa is one of these places where it's the youngest continent in the world. We're talking the median age in Africa is 19.4 years old in countries like Nigeria. It's 17 years old. This is a country of teenagers, but it's also the continent with some of the oldest leaders. So the gap between the governed and the governing is enormous, and the trust gap is also enormous. So what ends up happening is the Chinese are seen as an extension of whatever ruling power is there. So, so problem number two is the opacity and the lack of transparency. And, and, and the funny thing is that the Chinese would be much better off, and, and I just, I, for the life of me, I've, you know, just sometimes they are their own worst enemies. If they just showed that they're actually a lot of the terms of their deals on these loans are quite amenable. We're talking seven, eight, 10 year grace periods, 2% interest loans, very, in many cases, flexible repayment terms. There are some more onerous terms on the commercial contracts. But if they actually opened up their books and showed people what's going on, they, they'd really undermine a lot of the criticism. So it's always been a baffling thing to me that they have this massive insistence on secrecy. But that is the Chinese way of doing things domestically in China, as you know from your time there as well. Mm -hmm. This is a political system that does not have the same sense of accountability to its people that, uh, that others do. The third problem, and this relates to problem number two, is the emphasis on state-to-state -state relations. So we just got mm -hmm. through with the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. And it's it's a it's a it's a forum where every three years, uh, every African country except Iswatini gets together. Iswatini still recognizes Taiwan, so it's not invited. And uh, but every country gets there and they come and they they talk. But it's all, you know, governing elites to governing elites. And the Chinese have not done an effective job at all at engaging civil society, at engaging youth. Uh, in that sense, uh, from a state level. That being said, let me just say this really quickly. Public diplomacy in the 21st century engaging civil society is very, very difficult. No country today really does it well, in part because it's very complex to do it because everybody's on social media. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you know, you look at companies like Ford or GM or any of these companies that will spend a billion dollars a year trying to reach consumers, you, you know, to break through the clutter of noise. Uh, it's the same for governments as well. It, you know, to get your message out today requires enormous amounts of money because the media market is so fractured. 
but the Chinese have, have done worse than others in engaging civil society and youth. That being said, okay, and this is what I talked about in the beginning, the good and the bad always sit side by side. The new Afrobarometer public opinion data just came out, the update. And Afrobarometer is the most reputable survey and polling agency on the continent. And what they found was the Chinese and the Americans are neck and neck in terms of uh, favorability. In fact, in some cases, the Chinese are ahead of the U.S. in that. So the U.S. advantages in soft power and culture and, and, and whatnot, um, the gap is pretty narrow behind it. The, the Chinese soft power approach in Africa is not the same as, as what we've traditionally think of soft power. So Americans look at soft power as, you know, our movies, our music, our culture. So Beyonce, McDonald's, mm -hmm. you know, all of that. Um, that's the traditional idea that people want to be like us. That's the theory. Um, it's less so today, but that's the theory. The Chinese soft power is that in my lifetime, when I first went to China, China was poorer than most African countries. Mm -hmm. When I first went to China in 1989, people had, we got ration coupons for food. So every two days we got a, a coupon book that we went to go buy rice and oil and things like that. Uh, there was very little indoor plumbing. There was bicycles. There was no color. The per capita income was, again, at, at a basically a mid to low level of what Africa is. And in my lifetime, China has transcended from being one of the poorest countries in the world to being the second largest country in the world and arguably has societies far more advanced than what we see in the U.S. or in Europe in terms of infrastructure and technology and things like that. Africans look at that, and not just Africans, people throughout the global south look at that journey that the Chinese have gone on and say, it's possible. And this is what people in the global north don't understand, is they mm -hmm. say, you just, that, that this idea that we too can do it and that modernizing is not westernizing. That's a really important concept. That, that the Chinese have modernized, but they have not westernized. And traditionally, the idea was that if you're going to modernize, then you become into the liberal market system. You become a member of the WTO, you start trading, you take down your trade barriers, and you become a member of the Washington Consensus Club. The mm -hmm. Chinese kind of said, you don't have to do that. And, and that is a very appealing offer to, uh, to the guy on the street and to the guy in the presidential palace as well. Hmm. Um, so I did get a question that's a little bit specific, but related to potential yeah. complications. What is the actual scoop that you've done in an airport and okay. how it was reported in the Western media? It's, well, forget about <laughs> Western media. Forget about Western media, because we also have to start putting accountability on the African side here. Okay. Uh, not, not everything comes down to the West and to China. Got okay. It. <laughs> okay. So this yeah. whole story started with a Daily Monitor report about three weeks ago. And uh, if you go onto my site, I actually did a, uh, a, a, you know, a, a whole debunking of this story and why mm -hmm. and when, how it kind of came through. So Daily Monitor, and this is a story, by the way, that has been brewing for about four or five months now. That, and let me give just a little bit of background so that maybe your other viewers and listeners who aren't familiar with it. So the, uh, the Ugandan government uh, signed a $207 million loan with the China Exim Bank to refurbish and upgrade the Entebbe International Airport, which is Uganda's main international airport. They have expanded the cargo facilities, the passenger facilities. It's a huge upgrade. And remember that these transportation infrastructure projects are critical for countries to facilitate trade, tourism, and economic growth. So the idea is that this $200 million loan will be easily repaid through the enhanced economic activity. However, uh, it has come part the Ugandan parliament uh, started digging into the loan contract and found that there were a whole bunch of problems with the way the loan was negotiated. The finance minister, just about a month ago, goes before parliament and literally apologizes. And you don't see this very often in any political context. Ministers tend not to apologize in public. Mm -hmm. But he apologized for the fact that a, a number of the terms in the loan were poorly negotiated. And one of the things you have to understand about how these loan contracts are, are negotiated is that the Chinese have become incredibly sophisticated in understanding how to do business in places like Africa. Mm. And meantime, Africans have not used the past 20 years to upgrade their skills as much as the Chinese have upgraded theirs. 
And so what's ending up, and too often in Africa, one of the things is that they are still too accustomed and too oriented to dealing with the US and Europe. And so they have a very much of a mindset of, well, we're just dealing with foreigners and Europeans and Americans, and it's the way we've been doing things. And the Chinese are playing by a very, very different set of rules. One of the things that's come out of the research from groups like Aid Data at William and Mary College is that the Chinese, when they negotiate their loan contracts, will bring in $500 an hour lawyers from London and New York to do this. Okay. And they'll be sitting across the table from a mid level or upper mid level bureaucrat from the Ugandan finance ministry. And at the end of the day, a lot of the African negotiators are just getting outplayed by better legal counsel. And honestly, when we're talking about two and 300 million, maybe a billion dollar deals, that's on the African side for not stepping up and providing better legal counsel to negotiate these deals. And so again, the burden on some of these deals is not that the Chinese are tricking anybody or they're hoodwinking anybody, is they're just putting things out and the other side isn't taking the time or investing the resources to really understand the terms of the deals. This is what we learned about the Sikomins deal in the Congo that Kabila's people on this big $6 billion mining deal didn't even read it. I mean, it's just, it's just heartbreaking how the levels of incompetence sometimes on these things. So, you know, can you blame the Chinese? Yeah, maybe, but you know, business is business, right? You know, so anyway, the, some of the terms and, and the key area of concern was this, there's a clause in a lot of these contracts that waives sovereign immunity. And, and that is a trigger word for people. Mm -hmm. And so in the event of a, a default or a problem with the loan, countries cannot hide behind their sovereignty to say, we are a nation state, so therefore we don't want to negotiate. The waiver of sovereign immunity is a commercial clause in a contract that says you must go to third party arbitration. OK, mm -hmm. you can't just say you're a country. The problem is, and this is where the historical traumas of colonialism come into play. In Uganda and in Nigeria, where the same thing played out for most of this year on this question of sovereign immunity, the journalists and the public and social media and Twitter hear the word sovereign immunity, and they say our sovereignty is being compromised and taken away from the Chinese. Overlay on that the debt trap narrative that first started in India by an Indian professor, but then took hold in the US and has now taken hold in Africa. And you have this toxic brew of misinformation, okay? So the Daily Monitor does a three or four month investigation into the loan contract for the Entebbe airport. Not once in their coverage did they talk to a, a, an international contract expert who understands these contracts. Not once did they talk to somebody on the Chinese side. They said that at the end of the day, they reached out for comment on the Chinese side right before publication, but it was not the comment did not come back in time for publication. That's just shitty journalism, okay? That's just bad journalism. Um, and then at the end of the day, the, uh, the editors at the Daily Monitor put this narrative out that the airport has been seized, past tense. And here's what's crazy about this, this whole story. They have literally not even gotten out of the grace period of the loan. <laughs> They're not even servicing the loan yet. That starts next year. How could they default on the loan if they haven't even made a payment on the loan? So my point here is that the journalism was so bad, but that's, and, and this is the problem in Nigeria as well, is that people are taking little bits and pieces of information and, and not understanding these very complex terms and then spinning it into these just wild fantasies. And, and that's what ended up happening. But again, I, last point on this, the reason why this finds such a receptive audience in a place like Uganda is again, the historical trauma and the memories are fresh of what it feels like to lose control of your country because that's mm. already happened to them. And there is this feeling that we don't understand what's going on with the Chinese and with, the, with these loans, that it's happening again. And the level of cynicism that people have towards their, their, their own leaders, much like the way we do in our country, by the way, uh, leads them to the worst uh, to assume the worst. So there's, there's a couple of things in, um, that I would ask and also that are coming up in the comments. Yeah. Um, I want to talk to Mark's question as well about labor. We can talk. Yeah. To that. That's a great one. Uh, Cause I, I was actually about to ask that. Um, 
but this one it, it's disingenuous to say the Congo is no, the field given the history of the Congo. We, no, it's a, it's not it's not that it's disingenuous. It's the idea that that it's it's a positive message. OK, because mm. it, it very much is a, it's it's about Congolese agency and Congolese agency and agency swings both ways. It's a powerful, uplifting message that. And again, we saw the expression of agency at FOCAC at the recent China Africa summit, yeah. where a lot of the, the the terms and the priorities in the in the in the final deal were African priorities. But agency also means accountability as well. And, and it means being responsible for this because at the end of the day, these leaders who are making these bad deals that the, the, the citizenry have to end up paying for in the form of either higher inflation, taxation, all of these different things. One of the things the Chinese don't do is they don't forgive loans. These debts are going to be repaid. They're going to have to be repaid, whether a country can afford it or not. The Chinese have forgiven the zero interest parts of their debt, but they have made it very clear that they're not like the U.S. and Europe and will not write off these loans. And so Kenya, uh, the story we ran yesterday, Kenya, you know, it was had got debt deferral agreements from the from France and from Japan, uh, from others. Uh, but they shipped off two hundred sixty six million dollars to the China Exim Bank last quarter. So so again, the, the Congolese people are depending on their leaders to do better in these negotiations. That's what we're talking about. Yes, the Congo history is, there is no more tragic history on this planet than Congo's history. But if Congo is the centerpiece right now of the most important technological revolution of our time, which is the electronic electric vehicle revolution with the cobalt, uh, and, and, and there's an obligation and a hope that we want the Congolese leaders to be better so that they can deliver the infrastructure and the services and not burden their people with debt. That's where I'm coming from with this. So I understand what you're saying is, is disingenuous given the history, but uh, you know I'm actually coming at it from a point of positivity. Uh, yeah, um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about the uh, the the agency and the uh, forum for uh, China Africa cooperation for China Africa cooperation. Yeah, um, because. Um, the the U.S. narrative that was pushed almost immediately, and I think it may get complicated in the next few days, but it was yesterday where they were, this was released, um, was that China was retrenching from Africa because of a lowering of of you know agreements from sixty billion to forty billion, but but with a ton of vaccines and stuff going in, I guess is. Is it aid? Is a vaccine's aid? That's the is that yeah. So the yeah. vaccines, there's two parts. So it's a billion, it's a donation of one billion vaccines that she announced in his speech last Monday. Uh 600 million will be donated, and 400 million will be manufactured locally in Africa. So again, you know, and that is very much part of the the need to build uh sustainable manufacturing for vaccines so that Africans do not have to depend on the outside world for supplies. And so and China already has three factories that are committed in Algeria, Morocco and Egypt. Uh, there's talk about building in Senegal and Kenya wants to. There's a very big pharmaceutical manufacturing capacity in Africa. And this is why it's been complete garbage that the U.S., Europe and even China has not done more to offload and to create vaccine production opportunities in Africa. So that is that is really uh, that's a key a key part. Um, in terms of the 40, the 60, you know, one thing we know for sure, and this was my column yesterday, and it's on the homepage of my site, which I hope you guys will go check out and I hope you'll subscribe. Yeah, it's is, linked uh, in, the, in the show notes if people want yeah, to find and, it. Yeah, and we really hope that, you know, you're, you, you guys will check it out. Is It's hard. To, we still don't have a reading on what to take away from FOCAC. Was it a retrenchment? Was it a deepening of engagement? Uh, you know, there's takes on all sides. What we do know is that they completely bungled the message. They, mm -hmm. they, they did a terrible job at media management and at, at the messaging. So let's kind of walk through some of the outcomes of FOCAC, and then you can decide what you think, okay? Mm -hmm. So Xi Jinping, in his, in his speech, laid out $40 billion of, 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 of financial commitments for the next three years, Okay. And a, a number of these are, for example, taking the special drawing rights allocation from the IMF that every country got. He's going to allocate 10 billion of the 40 billion that China received just for Africa. 
Uh, we have not seen other countries do that yet uh, in that level. He said he's going to triple uh, exports from Africa from 100 billion to 300 billion. That is an expression, by the way, of the African priority. They're going to create uh, new export credits for African countries, up to 10 billion there. So the, the whole list of things that she listed was 40 billion. That is what most of the U.S. and European press, particularly FT and Bloomberg, zeroed in on. Ah, it's not 60 billion from the last time. It's 40 billion. That's a retrenchment. Then the narrative started to come in that, and this was the very bad African journalism narrative, was, well, China's economy is on the verge of collapse, so that's why they can't give money to Africa anymore. And you have to constantly remind people that China has a $14.72 trillion <laughs> economy. $20 billion is not going to make the difference whether China survives or doesn't, okay? So yeah. Africa is just not that big or that important. So, so that, and it's not because of, uh, of that. Here's the, where it gets a little bit sticky, okay? She did not put a price tag on the billion vaccine donation. And so China has been selling those vaccines between $7 and $35 a dose, the Sinopharm jabs, depending on the country and depending on the deal. If they price those at $33, which is what the Chinese charged Hungary for Sinopharm, for example, just or $30, mm -hmm. um, 600 million times $30 gets you to about $18 billion. All of a sudden, you're back at 60 billion very quickly. Okay. So they don't have a price tag attached to the vaccine uh, commitment. Also, in the Dakar action plan that was published, there are about 10 initiatives that are unfunded, that do not have dollar values attached to it, but they, are, they require funding. Uh, so the Chinese did not assign dollars values to that. That's going to come out in the next few weeks. And that's why the proponents of the narrative that say China is not retrenching say, listen, you got to look at the details. It's too early to come to the conclusion. But more importantly, you should not evaluate the health of the China-Africa relationship merely on the size of the financial pledge. That is a, uh, an oversimplification of the relationship. This is a relationship that is very complex, very diverse, and it extends far beyond simple aid money coming and going. That is not a healthy way of looking at it. We, we, this is a, a relationship that has, be, before COVID, 82,000 African students were studying in China every year. Uh, I mean, and, and that's not something that's factored into any of these kinds of, uh, of, of announcements. So, so something very important to take away. But let's say, just for the sake of argument, okay, that it was just $40 billion. $40 billion. Name me another country that is committing $40 billion to Africa just in the next three years. That is, it's still an enormous amount of money that is being committed. The Europeans aren't coming anywhere close to that. So the Europeans came out with their new uh, global gateway, which is $300 billion, but that's for the whole world. And that's $50 billion a year, but worldwide. Same for the, the Development Finance Corporation for the U.S., $60 billion worldwide, and with no time limit on it. This is 40 to $60 billion just for the next three years. And they've done 60 and 60. So this is the third time in nine years, in a decade, that they've committed these massive amounts of money. So I don't think that's a retrenchment in any ways. I think it's an evolution of the relationship. It's a changing mm -hmm. of the relationship. And it's a reflection of the times that smaller is probably going to be the order of the day for countries that are struggling to pay and service debts. I was going to ask you, um, and you mentioned it off air, that some of that lowering of the number might be from Africa's own priorities because of their they fear of They requested debt it. Well, no, for, no, 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 no. Oh, you had me almost until, Derek, Derek. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have you, said You had me all the word. way until the word debt trap. No, they're not worried about debt traps because that doesn't exist. Okay. What they are worried about is debt servicing costs. Mm. Okay. And, and, and so, and right now you look at a country like Kenya where $70 billion dollars of debt now, uh, they're not, and so they, and these countries don't have a a debt crisis. They have a revenue crisis, right? Okay, right. The debt is manageable if you're generating enough revenue. One very important point that I want to make for your 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 listeners and viewers, and this is going to probably surprise people when I say this. And I got into a big fight on the BBC about this last week. Okay, hmm. 
Um, they were saying, you know, African China has Africa has a Chinese debt problem. And I said, with all due respect, Africa does not have a Chinese debt problem. And and you just see the eyebrows pop up. What? I've only heard that Africa has a Chinese debt problem. About 10 African countries have a Chinese debt problem. Angola, Ethiopia, Djibouti, Zambia, ten, uh, Kenya, and Nigeria. Nigeria is on the list of countries that supposedly have a Chinese debt problem. And the amount of Chinese debt, this is very funny, is about $3.1 billion, which is less than 4% of Nigeria's total $80 billion debt. Mm -hmm. How is that considered to be a problem? Okay. I mean, just people have lost their minds when they think about these things. So we look at 10 African countries that have a, a debt problem. Of that debt, a third of it, even more, maybe 40% is tied up in Angola, just in Angola. Okay. So take Angola off the table and the Chinese debt issue becomes much smaller. The more important point of this is that 40 to 45 other African countries do not have a Chinese debt problem. You don't go to South Africa and talk about Chinese debt because they don't have any Chinese debt. Burundi, Malawi, Botswana. Let's go through the list of countries that do not have any Chinese debt. So this oversimplification of Africa is a key mm -hmm. problem in the discourse. Africa is not a country. OK, and by the way, the oversimplification of China is also a problem here because too many people feel that it's Xi Jinping sitting around a table of 10 people making all the decisions. Yeah, when we look at that. the no, the variety of actors that are involved here is so fascinating. It's Shanghai municipal is involved. The provincial governance governments are involved, state owned, private, semi private, you know, you name it. The state owned enterprises. There's so many different layers to this relationship. And so boiling it down to China and to Africa ends up missing so many of the details. But Chi let's just be very clear. Africa does not have a Chinese debt problem. About 10 African countries do have some serious problems. Okay. So, so debt threat narrative, we can throw that out. Yep. Um, uh, we, we have a revenue problem in about 10 countries. No, we have a uh, revenue problem in all countries right now. In all the countries. COVID it, has really created a big revenue problem. And and so the numbers probably reflect a realistic um, view of the African side of what it could possibly deal with in terms of That's right. business deals and debt. So what, what the African side has said is we still need infrastructure. And remember that if you're sitting in the president or prime minister's office of any African country today, you are staring down the, a double-barreled shotgun of demographics, mm -hmm. okay? This is the fastest-growing population in the world. It's a young population. And what, what are young people? Young people are impatient, okay? And this is the problem with African governance, is that too often it's not accountable and responsive to the needs of these young people. But young people are impatient, and understandably so. But people want jobs. They want better lives. They want a future. You cannot have that future unless you have infrastructure, okay? Infrastructure is the key to everything. No power, no business. No roads, no business. And you look in the Congo, and I lived in the Congo, and in the rainy season when the, ro when the roads just become just a mess. And getting from point A to point B is an eight-hour affair. Yeah, You're not I mean, going to have any business on this, okay? Yeah. So, so the Chinese come in, and they come in with a sense of urgency, now, when the Americans and the Europeans come in, what they'll first do is the, the first thing you have to do when you take a USAID project, and I know this because I managed a USAID project in the Congo, is you need a dedicated full-time staff just to manage the paperwork of the USAID project, okay? Then there's the environmental impact report, the community assessment report, the, you know, all of these different boom, boom, boom. It takes years to get anything done. Years, Okay. Remember this double-barreled demographic shotgun. Africans have to get things done now. We look at this, the bauxite for infrastructure deal in Ghana, the $2 billion bauxite for infrastructure deal. We interviewed um, this guy by the name of Henry Chierma from the finance ministry from Ghana on our show. He told us the most amazing thing. He said 18 months from the time of the first negotiation to a shovel in the ground. 18 months. That is speed. Yeah, you can't the, do that in, in the United States. In the United States, <laughs> I mean, look, I mean, we're, I mean, how long does it take to build a road or a bridge in the U.S.? I mean, it's crazy. In Kinshasa right now, 
uh, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi went to Congo in January and signed a deal for a new power substation for the capital. Uh, they broke ground on that in August. Okay, eight months. Eight months. That yep. is why African countries like turning to the Chinese because they get shit done. And, and then you talk about the Americans and the Europeans. And listen, I'm all for bringing more money into infrastructure for Africa. But when we talk about all of the values led, environmentally sustainable, all these different things, all I hear in my head is delay, 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 delay. And what people want is they want things to happen now. And, and, and because they're under this enormous pressure. So FOCAC was a reflection of that. The project size is coming down. Instead of billion-dollar projects or $6 billion railways like they built in Kenya or in Nigeria, it's coming down to $10 million, $20 million, $40 million, $100 million deals. Those they can crank out. They can pay them. They, they're, they're, they have quick turnarounds on the feasibility and the ROI, and they can get going within a year. So by next year at this time, this is what you should all be looking for. How many of the infrastructure deals that were announced at FOCAC and some of these initiatives, these smaller projects, um, will be implemented? And that's going to be something that the Chinese show their advantages in Africa. Mm. So I guess this brings us back to the labor question. Now, there's been two questions related to it. One, uh, how much uh, local labor is used yeah. in this Chinese is a great question. projects? And then two, how much skilling of African labor comes from these yep. Chinese-led projects? Okay, so couple different issues on this. Um, mm -hmm. The perception is now, and this is rooted in the early days of the China-Africa relationship. So remember I talked about in the early 2000s when the Chinese were first coming there. When the Chinese first came to, to Africa, they started doing these infrastructure for resources deals. They didn't know their way around. They didn't know how to get anything done. They didn't have deep relationships. They many, Money was easy and flowing. So whatever. And it and so when they were kind of tasked to build a road in rural Cameroon, they didn't know what to do. So early on, they brought in two Boeing 747s of workers from Shandong province, put them up in a makeshift dorm, keep them there for eight months, and then ship them back to China. That was the practice that happened 20 years ago. What ended up happening in the course of the 20 years is that the Chinese learned how to navigate uh, African labor markets. They learned how to deal with unions. They learned how to deal with local supplies and local leaders. They, And then they leaned into the hiring of local workers. Why? Because it brought the cost down considerably. The biggest misperception about the Chinese in labor is that China is this country of 1.4 billion people. It's overpopulated. It has to you know, shed people and people are moving to Africa because there's too many people in China. The truth of the matter is, is that China has a population crisis. It's just mm -hmm. not that population crisis. It's facing a declining population that's rapidly declining. The problem in China today, time. hyper, I mean, terrifyingly so, because they have the one child policy and because Chinese families simply do not want to have more than one child because it's so expensive now to have more than one child. So the population is going down. The cost of labor in China is skyrocketing. And that's why where I am in Vietnam, uh, we're getting all of the offshoring because companies like Nike and others don't want to pay the rates for labor in, in China. So imagine now growing labor costs in China, flying somebody over to Africa, rooming, boarding, protecting them, giving them bonuses. Forget it. Too expensive. Send them back. Today, and I have research and you can go on my website and I've challenged the Secretary of State on a number of occasions on this who continues to pro propagate this myth. Um, all of the research from the University of London, the China Africa Research Initiative, Johns Hopkins, the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, you, I mean, there are so many scholarly reports on this that have actually gone and looked at the local labor supply. And the numbers are consistently in the 80 to 90 percent local, locally sourced for low-skilled labor. The only places where they use Chinese imported low-skilled labor are in remote projects where it's difficult to source local labor. So, for example, in parts of building the standard gauge railway through the desert, uh, they couldn't hire locally. Locals didn't want to go. In Angola, they have difficulties hiring because they don't have a, enough a, a density of population. So that's been their, that's been what the researchers say. You can go to the SOAS. I have links to this all on my website. But what we know is that the numbers are in the 80 to 90 percent. In terms of skills training, the infrastructure projects are not aid programs. 
The Chinese mm. will be very clear about this. OK, you know, we, we look at every foreign engagement in Africa, as some kind of aid program. No, that's this. That's a dumb way of looking at it. They are tasked to build a road. And, and, and that is that's this is not a capacity building initiative. And here's the thing. The Chinese contractor, if they are late on delivering their part of the, the deal on any part of the project, gets massive fines. We're talking a million dollars a day in some respects, depending on the size of the project. So there is no incentive whatsoever to slow down the production. So on the infrastructure side, there's not much skills transfer and capacity building because that's not what these programs are for. In other parts, we're seeing a really big shift into vocational training in uh, Chinese vocational training in Africa. This is a very big priority going forward. This was one of the messages that came out of FOCAC, actually. Two reasons for it. So they're setting up vocational schools around Africa to do ICT, electrical engineering, very practical types of things. Uh, number one, that is done because those are the skills that young people need to develop economies. So there's a need for that. But also there's a geopolitical agenda here as well is that it facilitates China's ability to norm for norm setting. So if you learn how to maintain a Huawei 5G network system or 4G network or anything, then you are going to be less likely to switch from Huawei to, say, Ericsson yeah. or Alcatel because you have so been you, trained. So in you're there. in the so Chinese the, infrastructure skill set. You're in the right. Chinese skill. Yeah, that's right. They are training in which kind of makes sense. So the railway engineers are learning standard gauge railway techniques from China. The air traffic control engineers that they're training are learning Chinese technology and Chinese methods. The, you know, Huawei does an enormous amount of training in Africa. Uh, they are all learning Huawei systems. So there's a, you know, both sides to this, a geopolitical side that China wants to set standards for the rest of the world. And Africa is very important in all of that. And then there is a... Um, you know, a, a vocational CSR so slash this is aid side to it. Non sexy soft power. <laughs> this is non sexy, but man, let me tell you, super, super effective. Right. Okay. But let me tell you just on soft power, last point, and my battery is at 16%, and I told you I have no power at home. Right. So we're going to have a forced end to this conversation. Um, when I when I, I talked to, I, I was in uh, Abidjan a couple of years ago before the, uh, the in the Ivory Coast. And I asked, I was in a cafe and I speak French. And so I went up to these guys and I said, uh, these kids, they're about 16, 17. I said, what do you guys think of the Chinese? Quoi vous pensez de, la, de les Chinois? I'm just always curious to hear what the guy on the street has to say. And it was, it was, and I, usually I'm expecting of like, you know, debt traps and negative, like what you picked up on in, in Egypt a little bit. And mm -hmm. this, this, these kids, they kind of looked at it and they said, it's kind of weird that this white guy is asking me about the Chinese, but okay, whatever, you know. So one of the kids took out his phone and he said, La Chine, c'est super. China's great. I said, what? Okay. Tell me. Why? He said, I love Huawei. I love Boomplay. I love Start Times. I love, you know, Opay. And I was like, oh, wow. I love TikTok. They see the world through the brands and the technologies and the products that they use. And so what's in front of them is Chinese. And so he said, listen, I touch China two, 300 times a day. When he gets up in the morning, his phone, a transcend phone, the music, the boom play songs, he goes and warms his tea or coffee on the kettle. The kettle is made in China. The clothes that he wears are made in China. The road he took to work was made in China. He goes to an office. It's, you know, office equipment's made in China. He sees China in his everyday life. It feels real to him. And, and I said, well, how much do you touch the, the U.S., for example? And he said, other than Facebook, which is, you know, Facebook, YouTube, and Google, not much. And I'll tell you, here in Vietnam, it's the same thing. The American soft power isn't here because the American presence isn't here. And even on the God Almighty Hollywood that's so powerful, the content that people consume here is either Korean content, the K-Wave, or it's social media, which is their own content. Right. But Hollywood doesn't really factor into it that much. And, yeah. and, and so the relevance of the United States and the relevance of China in people's daily lives in the global south is very, very important to understand. We, as a culture, are not as relevant simply because we are not here. You don't come here and see lots of Americans on the street. Same in Africa. You don't see, uh, you know, they don't, they don't meet Americans, they don't, but they see Chinese people. They may not like them all the time. They may not understand, but they feel it in the relevance. 
They don't feel that America is relevant to them. And then the Americans will come and talk to them about democracy and human rights and governance and freedom of religion and these ethereal concepts, which, by the way, are really important. I don't want to diminish them. But in the day-to-day -day perspective of a 19-year-old Nigerian or Abidjan you know, student, eh, the phone is going to be much more important. And that's, I think that's a really important message to think about. So, I mean, the, the great irony here in some ways is the communist Chinese have outcapitalist the Americans in, in, in Africa in a very yeah. real and well, in many and, parts of the world. I mean, in many yeah, parts yeah, of Southeast the world. Southeast Asia, too. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the Latin America. I mean, yeah. And they've used they've they've used a lot of the capitalist tactics and techniques. Uh, I mean, Transon is again, I hope you guys will go look at Transon. Uh, mm -hmm. They just posted for this year three quarters five billion dollars in revenue just from africa five billion in revenue from africa it's a chinese company based in shenzhen incredible yeah, okay. i think i had a trans in <laughs> they're fantastic <laughs> they are fan i mean and but it's great i mean but that's the but that's why people see the optimism and the excitement that they're coming to africa to build businesses they're mm -hmm. not coming to say we're going to give you aid. So going back to that French, you know, the French president encounter where he said, we're tired of the aid. We're tired of the paternalism. Come and do business with us. And, and that's in many ways what the Chinese are doing. Hmm. Well, thank you for your time. I think this I hope my this pleasure. is clarifying for my for I my, hope so, too, for my uh, listeners and viewers, because I think. If you're anti Chinese, this is going to complicate your, your point of view. But if you're say pro Chinese, but because you you believe something like the like China still works on 70s Maoist lines, this should probably uh, be kind of a shock to the system. Um and thank you. I, I uh my big goal right now is to get American and particularly the American left uh and the and the English speaking left to actually engage with the world as it is. Yeah. Um and not their projections upon it. And you you've come and helped us out today uh Fantastic. i am a subscriber to the china uh to the china africa project um so uh, i hope you guys you know we have a we, we, we intentionally kept the subscription rates low because we want to make it accessible so it's seven dollars a month for students and teachers and fifteen dollars a month for everybody else we have about four thousand articles in the archive our goal is to complicate your understanding of this issue i want you to be more confused about this issue than when you started this conversation, because that is the beauty of it, is you is, is the complexity of it. So uh, ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. We also have a Patreon community for our podcast. Uh, we would love for you guys to become part of our, our community. It's uh, There's a great, and we have a really respectful, civilized discussion. We really, that's what we're going for. We, we love disagreements, uh, but we don't like screaming and shouting. And uh, so and that, and we, and we have such great people from all over the world participating in this community. So we hope you guys will uh, will come and join us. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Have a great day. And uh, thank you for coming in despite all the complications. Thanks so much. Bye, guys. Bye. All right. I'm Dana Handel, so I'm patron business. Um, uh, I think I said that R.C. Sproul was coming on uh, to – to the show on monday and i meant rc roberts uh, rc sproul is a is a calvinist theologian that i read once uh and i don't know why i turned rc roberts into rc sproul that was a strange strange cross wiring um but nonetheless rc roberts will be coming on to talk about secularization and uh uh, I think maybe that's where the theologian came into my mind. I need to announce some new um, high lover patrons. Um, uh, so we have some uh, $10 and up supporters uh, who have commission shows for the Patreon, uh, Ryan Foster, uh, unnamed Patrick, and Ivan Ivanovich uh, from Eastern Europe. Um, so I would love, uh, for you guys who are patrons to, uh, come on, on, uh, but if you're not, we have plenty of free material. Um, uh, I will make these important interviews free, uh, because I think the bulk of what I do should be available to the public. And if you really want to help me out and you like conversations like this, just share them. All right. Share them, share them, share them. And 
that's what I need. Um, right now, our uh, our views are kind of low, but our 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 engagement over on the podcast is actually quite high. And so, um, for six months on podcast, we're doing kind of good. Um, so you guys are really helping out and, uh, I hope you come on. We also have a lot of patrons and a lot of patron stuff. So if you can, I have, uh, you know, my lowest patron level is three bucks. Um, and the discord community, once you're in it, you're in it as long as you want to be in it, unless you break our rules. Um, so, you know, uh, and that is to say, if you have a rough month, uh, I don't kick you out of that. I don't kick you out of our community, uh, just because you had a rough month. Um, maybe I shouldn't say that, but, uh, so I am, uh, pretty open on that kind of stuff. So that's my ad. I hate buskering, man. That's one of the weirdest things about, uh, being a podcaster is e-busking. Um, but yeah, share the work. That's the important thing. Um, so again, R.C. Roberts, not R.C. Sproul, talking about secularization and existentialism and Marxism. Uh, I'm also going to be, tr I'm trying to book an interview with some specialist on Honduras uh, so that we can talk about the Honduras situation. Um, you just heard me go from wild gringo into kind of speak Spanish. I apologize. Um, hopefully I'll get that nailed down and be able to announce that to you. It'll probably be in early January. I will be taking, I will be pre-recording some episodes. Uh, um, I don't have an inner Michael Brooks. That's weird. Um, I will be pre-recording some episodes uh, for, for Christmas um, with European guests. Um, Cause when I book European guests, I have to record them in the morning on a weekend. Um, and so you'll be getting those during Christmas. Uh for the channel thank you so much uh we had a patrons only special yesterday we got specials coming up uh with uh sean kb for antifada and for barnbell patrons um that'll be a regular thing and uh we got new ro uh, we got new no royal roads coming up for free on the podcast um so uh i am busy uh <laughs> AF. It's also, I have a 60 hour a week day job. So, um, uh, it's, you know, um, so yeah, I'm, but anyway, and I'm tired. So I'm kind of giddy. Thank you for coming in today. Share, review, like, and subscribe, hit the bell, all that crap. Bye.